chapter 17. <clears throat> in the gleaming Ascadia city, the council is meeting in the central tower's lower levels to make an agreement with the elf emissary. The council members include Thuzegius, a world elf, Macarth, a Tempest Guild member, Edgar, a Dragon Knight of Escadia, and the newly elected Cayman of Hoppos, as Hoppos now allows the Tempest Guild there and has recently built a hall there. Queen, Queen Lita was in the council, but no attempts have been made as of yet to rescue her. The elf of the council brings it up in the debate and says, What of, Qu what of Queen Lita? Are we to sit by as she is in Felgen and Orc hands? The council look at one another, then Edgar says, I say we fly, dragons and all, and attack the city, both for Queen Leda and to take back the city from the Orcs. The elf emissary laughs, waving his hand and says, No, we elves are masters of stealth in the hunt. Even surrounded by beasts, we can gather the herbs we need. In other words, we should not blunder in just for that for this. The dragon knight gets angry and yells, do not talk down to me, elf, and slides his chair up further. I meant nothing, trust me, though. We elves of treetop of tree can get Lita back. We have mastered the art of war with the orcs. Cayman raises his fingers to the air and says, I support this elf's idea. Stealth would be better. I agree, says, says Thuzegius. It is official, then? We must get the queen back here so that intel can be established further, says the Zedius. Cayman, can this emissary and his force to use the Tempest Guild transport system to reach High Post? asks the Zedius. But of course, Cayman replies with a smile. The emissary then lays out his strategy. They will wait near Fendragolus trees and bushes until nightfall when they, f when they sleep. Then they will infiltrate the castle. As that very day went on, Kriev and his army was close to the Riffelin border. They reached Felgen Bridge and everyone there stood in place from what they were doing in absolute amazement. None knew what to think as they saw before them a massive army of dwarves, a race thought lost to the pages of history. A settlement that was once busy and loud was now quiet, their eyes following the dwarves as they marched. Kriev yelled to everyone there saying, we are merely passing through, sorry. Some nodded, others looked at others and back, and some whispering now. Korea stopped in the middle of town and said, Actually, now that you mention it, we could use some supplies. Just then, dozens of merchants swarmed the Dwarf King, offering jewelry, even arms. Some offering their fruits and herbs, tonics, and some putting fur capes on his back. The one that did this said, They are yours, keep them. He then backed away from Kriev. Someone in the crowd lets out a loud announcement. The dwarves have returned. I say. And everyone cheers toward the large party of dwarven warriors. Kriev looks down and then holds his warhammer up high. Felgen's up on the building bridges that connect them start to clap and wave. Kriev tells his men, make camp with everyone else. Get to know them. It has been long since we mingled with the surface folk. The warriors hunker down with the people of Felgen Bridge and exchange stories, how they slew mighty orc armies in the past and how they must slay a red dragon to be accepted by their kin. The people of Felgen Bridge tell of peace there for many generations, as the barbarian attacks have all but stopped thanks to the mighty Felgens being concentrated into one spot and sending out raiding parties of their own. Little did Kriev know, but he carried an amulet that could unite the Felgans of Felgen Bridge against the Felgen revolutionaries of Soratopa. <coughs> One glanced it over and gasped a little, then let out a bellow. Felgen, hear me. This dwarf has the amulet of Sora. They look shocked and start to kneel before Kriev. A look of surprise also comes to Kriev's face. By right, we are sworn to march with and protect the one carrying the amulet. Kriev looks down curiously and lifts the amulet off his chest in his hand. Kriev yells happily to them. When the time comes, I shall call upon you. Until then, may the stone keep you all proud. The dwarfs set out then at dusk, heading south out of the settlement. They cross the massive expanse 
of Felgen Bridge in falls of two. The right and left dwarfs both gripping the ropes of the long and massively vast bridge. Onward to treetop point they go, marching, shaking the bridge as they pass. People seen in the far, far distance, waiting on the large army of dwarfs to make it to the end of the bridge. It is a narrow bridge. A dwarf begins to slip through off the side and cries for help. Just then a fellow dwarf grabs him by his right arm and pulls him up. The dwarf is clipping. Whoa now, as the bridge sways once a bit too much. They eventually reach the other side, most letting out a sigh of relief and laughing among one another. Kriev now has Felgen Bridge on his side, not that he ever wanted more troops. Dwarves are not as bad about it as the elves, but they tend to want to keep among themselves more or less. The dwarf king will implore his former friends at Treetop Point to help them defeat the orcs. They see nothing different now. Orcs still cause the world trouble. The bronze armor of the dwarves gleamed in the light of the near dusk. Their large maces, almost bigger than them, being used as massive war canes. The, the snow has all but melted off them, and they were tired of travel. In between Dress and Felgen Bridge was Treetop Point, hidden in a crafted forest. Creative remembered how to get there. Through the forest and up a rocky pass was how, and he had high hopes. He walks with both hands using the fang, like a war cane to stride. At day's end, he would make peace with old friends. At a jerry of Morvund, Darkin has awoken to find himself caged and guarded by dwarves. The dwarves mock him, at, and as they do, he tries to fling magic out of his cell and is instead flung back himself against the other side of the cage. Kriev instructed them to keep him alive and feed him red dragon meat and give him water. Let me out, he yells. Dark, Darkin yells angrily at the four dwarves in the massive carved out and glowing room in the deep. One laughed at another and said, Never, banging the cage and laughing, still mocking Darkin. One spoke up and said, Enough, fools, let us treat our, our guests with as much respect as we can muster. Darkin smirks and then angrily bangs his hand against one of the bars. He then rotates in the cage and sets down on the rags that were put inside. The dwarves discuss food and prepare to go out under the deep to hunt a red dragon, using magic given to them by Kriev to make them able to thwart the dragon. In the deep, battle is heard, fire crashing against stone, stone crushing into stone, and dwarves roaring with fury at some loud beast in the dark recesses. Darkin rips a bar loudly and slides his hand down on it. He then slumps down and hangs his head low. For the time, Darkin is rendered a prisoner, and for the first time he begins to feel guilt for what he has done. Such dreaming, such hoping, does it reveal who he, we really are inside? The great battle mage Kriev has beaten Darkin before the fight even began. How could Darkin win against such a foe? What was it that made him so evil in the first place? It is that Darkin knows, and Kriev knows. It is night in the former Fendraggle, and the elves are in disguise, orcs and felgons, and orcs and other orcs passing them by and not even knowing they are there. The orc layabouts have the gate wide open, and they are laying in chairs and on the floor, either asleep or partially asleep. The trees become elves, and, and they quickly, but very quietly, sneak past all of them into the castle. Find Queen Leda. She will most likely be in the bedroom up ahead, whispers the emissary. The small party of elves, five in number, cling to the walls and corners. The coast is clear. They make their way to Hegerbo's bedroom from a hallway. From there is going in both directions, lined with windows of outside torches can be seen. They creep into Hegervo's room, daggers and bows drawn, and find themselves sleeping in his bed, and Leda brushing her hair at a table and mirror. She turns around in surprise, brushing no more, and Elf signals her to not to speak. She quietly puts down the brush and as quietly as possible walks to the elves, hugging one 
looking at Hegavro, and they slowly walk out into the dark hall, lit in places by the numerous torchlight from outside the windows. The emissary whispers to her, Crouch down. We do not want them to see uh, up through the, these large windows. They are then spotted from out in the darkness. Orcs down the hill have seen movement in the castle. Queen Lita panics and says, Oh no, they will kill you all. You must leave at once. The emissary smiles and says, No, I have another plan. Here, put on this ring. It will turn you into a bush for about an hour. It will feel strange to a human, but you can handle it. Queen Lita nervously waves her hand down. And the emissary whispers again, like I said, I have a plan. Put it on, you two fellow elves. They put on the ring, rings and transform into bushes in such an odd place. A group of orcs and falcons find the bushes in the hall and are quite puzzled. Do we throw these away or what? said a falcon. An orc then said, whoever tracked these in is in for it. The falcon locked, looked, the falcon looked and said, you're right. We best not let Dane or Hegavro see this mess. Let's throw them in the pile by the stables with the rest of the timber. After the half hour expires, they awaken a large pile of wood near the stables. I took a gamble and I won, said the emissary. Ouch, get me out of this, said Queen Lita. Too loud for her own good or theirs. They wasted no time and headed just a short distance in the pitch darkness to a horse stabled. stabled. The emissary said, Get on and make haste as fast as you can to Escadia City, Queen Lydia. We will sneak away on our own. Keep that ring and use it if you find yourself in trouble. She has helped up on the, bla on the, on the black horse and speeds away past all of the broken siege machines and dragons. The orcs and felgons... The only ones that really care about her speeding off of the keep are the Felgans. Hegervo's plan, oh no, says one of the other others, watching in the far distance as a horse speeds away, heading north to Escadia and Elo. Fendrakel sits on the northern border of Elambrad, and Hypos is just up the road. The fact that Hypos has taken so long to act on these circumstances is startling. Queen Lita will not enter high post proper and will ride fast directly for Escadia City with her information. A mere early morning trip and she is entering Escadia. The city has many stables all throughout and outside the city. She stables hers at the central tower. She gets in and receives the fanfare that would be expected from a captured council member being kidnapped by orcs. She never wanted to be there. She only played the part and played on Hagerbro's weaknesses, his emotions. She has a grand tale to tell and will, but for now she wants only to rest in a bed by herself for a change. <clears throat> the next morning they held a meeting for her in the upper tower, the bustle of the, of the city apparent. She spoke of her time with Hagerbro and the company was surprised it was not worse. He kept me around as his plaything. It was horrible, but I know now I could not have been. It, it it could not have been much worse. He had his eyes set on my position here, on the council, and knew he could only persuade it out of me. She put her elbows on her large round table, on the large round table, and puts her palms against her face. They want forces. They also want to attack High Post. Well, Hagerbro does. Dane, the orc leader, pretty much wants the whole world. She then says lowly, came and says, this does not bode well for us, then we must strike. High post is my home. I will not watch it burn. Edgar speaks and says, I have sent word to all villages in both Elo and Elamborat to evacuate. We shouldn't have to worry about their safety in all of this. Lita thinks to herself and begins to mourn her husband and daughter. And she did many nights in Hag with Hegavro. Where's my daughter? She asked the council members. She was in drill with, with the war coming. Her and her husband are staying in high post. Rumors are starting to spread already. She looks at, at Thuzegius as he says this and asks, Husband? 
He nods and says, yes, she married a captain of your former guard named Renault. They were living happily in Drell until the orcs started attacking. She stayed some time with my brothers and sisters in Treetop Point because she put on the amulet of Sora and got the fakers. Queen Lita confused asks, what is that? Thuzedius then replies, Fakers, it is the after effect of putting on the amulet. My people healed her of it. She is fine, do not worry. Queen Lita sinks her head down, tapping the table with her nail. I have not fully forgiven her for what she did to me, but I still and will always love her. She is my daughter. Can you tell me where she is in high post? Cayman then looks at her and says, The fancy inn. The fancy. The fancy inn near Portsmouth Farm. There, your highness. If you don't mind the weird transition, you can travel to her using the Tempest Guild transport system. She says, No, I would rather not. Thank you. I will, however, go meet my daughter and her husband. We have much to discuss. The meeting ends and the members retreat off into the multitude of people going about their ways. Lita pets the horse that freed her from bondage and says to it, Thank you, my friend, for helping me escape and begins to feed it vegetables. Off she goes to High Post to warn the king and meet up with her daughter at the inn. Unsuspectingly, it is a beautiful day and all is well. Her black straight hair cascading down her shoulders and her acute facial features gazing into the horizon.